Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Elena, and I run events at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Maylee's new collection of short stories, Tomorrow in Shanghai, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 95 years, The Strand is a sole survivor, now run by third generation owner, Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers and authors, such as May Lee and Sequoia, we wouldn't be here today. We are thrilled to have May Lee with us for the launch of her new collection, Tomorrow in Shanghai. May Lee Chai is the author of 11 books, including her new short story collection, Tomorrow in Shanghai. Her previous collection, Useful Phrases for Immigrants, won the American Book Award. She teaches in the MFA program in creative writing at San Francisco State University, and her writing has been awarded a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, Asian Pacific American Award for Literature, and she is a recipient of an honorable mention for the Gustavus Myers Center for the Study of Bigotry and Human Rights Book Awards. Joining Mei Li in conversation is Sequoia Nakamatsu. Sequoia is the author of the national best-selling novel, How High We Go in the Dark, a New York Times editor's choice, as well as a short story collection, Where We Go When All We Were Is Gone. His work has appeared widely in publications such as Conjunctions, Tin House, The Iowa Review, and One World a global anthology of short stories. He is an associate professor of creative writing at St. Olive College and teaches in the Rainier Work Writers Workshop Low Residency MFA program at Pacific Lutheran University. He resides in Minneapolis with his wife, dog, cat, and robot dog named Calvino. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming May Lee and Sequoia to the stage. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you so much, May Lee, for inviting me to chat about your wonderful collection. Um, as you know, Elena was doing the introductions, I was just kind of staring at some of these blurbs. And I'm not gonna argue with Charles Yu, um, illuminating, heartbreaking, and yet also very funny. Tomorrow in Shanghai is a rewarding and entertaining read. And you know, before I have ask you, um, you know, an opening question, I'll just say that um, reading this was just such a pleasure, and reminded me of discovering on my own because I had to. These books weren't taught to me in high school or in college. Um, writers like Yian Li, when A Thousand Years um, of Good Prayers came out in the early 2000s, discovering writers like Maxine Hong Kingston and David Mura, especially his memoir, Becoming Japanese. Um, I think for a writer like me, I think for a lot of um, Asian American or Asian writers, um, it was definitely a journey in trying to find books that reflected um, in any way um, my own experiences, the experiences of my family, my grandparents, and something that I really appreciate about this collection is that, yes, it's thematically tied by family and home and identity and the complexities that arise um, for all of those things um, when we look at immigration, when we look at race relations, bad men, um, patriarchal structures. Um, but what I, I love what I love most about this is that it showcases the diversity of the Asian American, the Asian diaspora. Um, it's not just um, you know one singular story. And for a long time, I think in in publishing in film, we got a singular story of what it meant to be Asian or Asian American. And here we for see too long. <laughs> for too long, too for long. much too yeah. long, for much too long. And see here we see strong women. We see uh, people in impossible situations of multiple generations um, just living their lives and trying to find love, trying to find themselves. So I, I want to start off with I, I love story collections. It's probably not a huge surprise because I wrote one you know, and, and my novel is kind of a novel in stories. But story collections are kind of strange beasts in that they often are written um, over many years. And so putting a book together like this sometimes becomes a bit of a kaleidoscopic endeavor, a bit of a puzzle. Um, so I'm just curious to know what your journey is uh, or was in writing tomorrow in Shanghai. Um, 
when did you know that you had a collection um, and how particularly in, has the last couple of years, the pandemic era that we're in right now influenced this at all? Oh, that's a great question. Well, first I want to say thank you, thank you, mm -hmm. thank you, Sequoia, so much for your beautiful introduction and your deep reading, and also just for agreeing to do this. I am such a big fan of oh. you all of your writing, but also how high we go in the dark. Um, and it's just a pleasure to be able to talk with you, and thank you to The Strand for hosting us. Um, you know, I, I, I had put together a um, short story collection called Useful Phrases for Immigrants, and that was very intentional, and that was in response to the rise of Donald Trump. And I had put those stories together, even though they were written at different times, but I kind of edited them with that intention because I didn't think he would ever, ever become president. But I just thought that what he was unleashing during his campaign was so xenophobic and so horrible that we're going to have to live in that aftermath. And so I was trying to put together these stories that I thought could like counter that type of really horrible hate speech, anti-immigrant anti hate speech, all, you know, um, and especially like his emphasis, China, 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 and just the horrible things he said. Mm -hmm. um, and then we talk about a pandemic. We have the viral pandemic and then we have the pandemic of hate that he did absolutely unleash and encourage. And so I wrote the majority of these stories during his reign of terror. Yes. Um, and so when I put the collection together, um, I put it at the behest of my publisher, Blair. I'm so happy to be working with them. Um, and I had to think about, well, what do I have to say about this moment? And I had been writing a lot of essays and I've been working with my colleagues at San Francisco State to get out the word about Stop AAPI Hate, an organization they funded, that they actually founded, excuse me, not funded, founded to kind of deal with like this nonstop onslaught of anti-Asian attacks mm -hmm. that I, I myself have had to file like 11 reports. And, you know, my father and I were, were like chased from Ocean Beach here in San Francisco mm -hmm. early on in the pandemic. So like, how do I write about this? How do I respond to it? And what was coming out organically from me um, were these stories that were set in different time periods, earlier time periods, but were also dealing with this kind of like xenophobia and these kinds of difficulties. And as you know, and as you had said earlier, when we were before this, before the cameras got on, we we're talking about the gays, right? Like mm -hmm. just like you, you come from a coast, and like we both went to school at Grinnell in Iowa, and suddenly you realize people can stare; they'll just stare at you, and you feel very um, noticed. And so I thought about how to respond to this present moment in these stories without setting any one of them in this present. So I've got stories that are set you know, at various times in the 20th century and then one 100 years in the future. But all of them are kind of tied together by this sense of people, specifically Chinese and Chinese Americans, trying to survive in the present moment. And I feel like that was the only way in fiction that I could emotionally kind of respond to the violence of the present and contextualize it, but also to kind of give us a path of resilience out of it. Um, I wrote a lot of essays set in this moment, but I just, mm -hmm. in fiction, it was, it's been too much. It's been too heavy and horrible. I have to say, I salute you for how high we go <laughs> in the dark. You can write a pandemic novel and it's hopeful. And I'm like, and I don't even, I don't mm -hmm. even talk about the pandemic in these stories. Mm -hmm. That's just like the, the one thing that too much. Right. It seems like a lot of these stories happened. I mean, at least kind of contextually either pre pandemic or, or in some ways they're, they're timeless. Um, but yeah, I love that you brought up the gays because a lot of these stories, um, it's the gays is a huge part of the theme of, of the book, not just the gays from white neighbors or society at large, but the gays that one that you have for yourself, perhaps, you know, if you're an interracial person, as some of the characters are in the book, um, you get the gays by your family members kind of that critical gaze of expectations and what you're supposed to do to be a good child, a good daughter, a good son. Um, but that said, there, 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 you mentioned your last story um, that takes place 100 years in the future. Um, and then there's the first story, the, the title story, Tomorrow in Shanghai. And I'm such a nerd for um, story collection structure and order. Um, because you can put together a bunch of stories and, and call it a collection, but there's always, I think, a level of intentionality over the ordering and certainly how you begin a book. 
And a lot of the stories do seem to be a little bit more contemporary and are family focused, um, especially I think mother and daughter relationships. Um, but that first story, Tomorrow in Shanghai, centers around um, a doctor um, that is, and I guess sort of this industry, this illegal industry of, of um, procuring blood um, from from rural communities and and selling them to it was hospitals. Actually legal. Right, um, legal. Um, both of both of these things. It's a it's a tomorrow in Shanghai is kind of the mm -hmm. crime story uh -huh. um, for those who haven't read it yet. And it's it's the, what's interesting is that these are terrible jobs, mm -hmm. and it involves a doctor who's extracting organs mm -hmm. from an executed prisoner and a man, the, the prisoner who's been convicted of infecting villages with AIDS um, and with HIV and causing mm -hmm. AIDS and what's interesting about probably the, the two worst jobs on earth right. that I can think of to put together is that both of them were totally legal when they started, mm -hmm. right? Wow. So the, the man who's the prisoner, like it was totally legal for him to be a blood merchant and being sent by hospitals, um, you know, on a commission basis mm -hmm. to go to these rural villages and collect plasma and, you know, with very, very rudimentary training. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, and this, you know, started, well, at least we became aware of it in mid nineties. Um, that's when the world and probably the Chinese government became aware of this, mm -hmm. um, when people actually started getting sick, but it had been going on for like a good decade before that, again, a legal job and people weren't given like the people who were doing it didn't know much about hygiene, right? They were pooling the blood and re-injecting it into people. They, and I think it's nobody's goal to infect their own province, oh, with, you know, with a pandemic. Mm -hmm. But they were, of course, then blamed and executed mm -hmm. when there was found out. And right. so similarly, actually for many years, it was decades, it was completely legal also in China to take organs from like executed prisoners um, because they didn't have a donor culture. Mm -hmm. And then around the time that China joined the WTO, there was an agreement saying that they would phase that out. And I thought it was, I was looking at it, I did research for the story. It's interesting to me that it actually persisted um, for quite a while, you know, in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And then like the side deals are kind of like then, because, you know, there's the officials will not put it into the organ pool, but like they'll mm -hmm. kind of sell it to wealthier people and so again these these horrible mm -hmm. things start as legal and then kind of right um sketchier and your mm -hmm. horrible job and i thought it worked as the start of the collection because all of my characters are kind of working people right no mm -hmm. one's wealthy this is not the crazy rich asians book right right <laughs> yeah <laughs> no, these are the working people you know book this is the mm -hmm. working asians book and um it starts off like the kind of crummy jobs people have to take to support their families, right? Mm -hmm. The one, the, the blood merchant, he had a sick wife, he had to pay her medical bills. The Even the doctor, you think of a surgeon as being above it all, but he's got horrible debts. He wants to get married, he wants an apartment, he's got to start off his life. And so he's taking on these, as he says, side jobs, right? To pay for that. And I felt like that set a kind of tone mm -hmm. um, for the collection of people who are in difficult situations because they have to make a living right. to support their families and themselves. And this is like the worst jobs that I could think mm -hmm. of. <laughs> and I mean, so, but it, and it sounds, I people don't think it sounds terribly bleak, but it's, you know, what people have had to do. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I liked about it as the start of the collection. So I'm glad you talked about like the intentionality because mm -hmm. um, my editor and I, Robin Mura at Flair, kind of thought about intentionally like how what kind of journey will the reader go on through these stories and one of the threads is this idea of of hope even in, the, in its in your most bleakest time and i thought of shanghai as that metaphor mm -hmm. for like hoping for a better future because if you know for china for at least most of the 20th century and even i would say contemporary times shanghai has always been considered like the most modern the most um the, the the most desirable city for many people to live in and um it has uh the most international kind of community and so i felt like that's that bright future shanghai mm -hmm. oh but tomorrow it right now sucks mount now mm -hmm. might really really suck but tomorrow <laughs> in shanghai as the doctor says to him it will be better mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like that's the theme that can pull my characters through. That I love that. I love that and love kind of sort of the background into background research that you did on, on that story. 
And of course, we we end the collection in New Shanghai <laughs> um, on this sort of you know um, Martian colony. Um, and also love that opening story and how it sort of sets up this juxtaposition between um, classes and how people from various classes are always kind of on the outside looking in or completely unaware of the circumstances of, of what other people might be going through. Um, I'm thinking especially about uh, Mr. Wan from, from that last story, just kind of this very arrogant kind of tech guy um, who's doing atrocious things, but is completely unaware of, of how horrible of a person he is. There's a there's one line I, I want to read from that opening story that really, I think for me, um, helps set the tone. Um, and this idea of, I think, not really sort of being able to see things. In the distance running parallel to the multi-lane highway was a slightly elevated dirt road where an old man was driving a wooden cart pulled by an ox. A younger man buzzed past him on a motorbike and the ox snorted once, pulling his head back. The old man called out and the ox steadied itself and continued on its way as stolid as if it were pulling a plow through a paddy. Instead, the young doctor stared only at the back of the seat in front of him as though that might speed his return to civilization. I just love those passages there because it really does kind of put, you know, two worlds side by side and focusing on the doctor, um, wanting to kind of get back to what he believes is the re quote unquote real world. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you liked that that part. So that was, you know, something I mm -hmm. put intentionally mm -hmm. in the story to show that contrast. Um, and I think that in a lot of early fiction and even science fiction of the 20th century, mm -hmm. from, you know, the earliest silent film about going to the moon mm -hmm. to like the Jetsons when I was a kid that was still on TV and reruns. The future is always like everyone is the same future, mm -hmm. right? Like right. the Jetsons, everyone has the fancy car and the bubble apartment in the sky and the ro robot made. Um, but it, like what we see very much in our own present is no, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I live in San Francisco. We are supposedly the heart of technology of the whole world. We're here, we are in Silicon Valley. We've got Google, we've got Apple, we've got all these companies and we have people living on the street, right? right. If you, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, we have people living in what, could be considered very 19th century, um, very primitive um, conditions and with no access to any of this technology. Mm -hmm. And growing up as a kid, um, I never really thought of that, right? Like in the seventies, when I was in ele public elementary school in New Jersey, people would talk about, this, you know, the future is gonna be so bright for you and mm -hmm. all these things. and in the, then the 80s hit with Reagan. And I was like, oh, no, guess what? We're not going to have that. We're going to like put the brakes on and go backwards. And that's when we, I remember, we started having a huge homeless problem in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a huge pandemic. And the government's like, eh, eh, you deserve it, right? And then we see this, um, this refusal to move as a community mm -hmm. um, and meet the needs of the community. Um, and so a lot of the stories are also set in the 80s because mm -hmm. I, I just I've been thinking about it sure. in the present, like what causes and a lot of it is, is some of those those policies that were put in place, the laws that were passed and the attitudes that were normalized in, in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And I love what you kind of said about the future, because when you said the Jacksons is like, oh, well, a white family in the future and a lot of depictions of the future, I think, especially when you're thinking about something like Blade Runner, you see. Asians, Asian community, um, Asian culture as exotified, as a world um, that's there for white communities to navigate in. Um, but in The Nanny, your, your final story, we're in New Shanghai. And so we are focusing not on white characters, on white communities, we're focusing on, on you know, on Asian characters. And I love that you're centering, um, I love kind of that sort of, I guess, you know, I, I often find sort of depictions of the future um, very problematic in that they're othering and, and exotifying Asian communities. And then that's not kind of what's going on here. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit more about that final story? Because again, it's 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 both. I think a book end to the to the collection that makes sense, the thematic sense, and revisits in some ways the first story. But it also does, right? It's a hundred years in the future. How does speculative fiction um, fit into your understanding of tackling issues of race and identity, um, sexuality, so on and so forth? And did you have to do any kind of special research for this particular story? Well, thank you. You know, Sequoia, this is why I wanted to be in conversation mm -hmm. with you because mm -hmm. I thought this is something you do really well in mm -hmm. How High We Go in the Dark. Also, like bringing in these issues of culture mm -hmm. and race and identity, centering like a Japanese, a Japanese American scientist, but mm -hmm. also it mixing with the world. And like, there's one story with the bereavement at hotels in which you have two Chinese characters with different personalities having a conversation. I feel like there should be a Bechtel test for race, <laughs> and none of them is like symbol symbolizing Asian anything, right? They're, they're just they're people. Living, yeah. They're living in the world. <laughs> this is their job, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they're not. They're also not like wearing yellow face they're not like a white character but they're really very much embedded with their own cultures i think you mm -hmm. do that really well and i think that i'm shocked by how hard that is for people to write this way as i read it for example other novels um and or watch movies in the present like gosh like how long does it mm -hmm. take for us to right. be human right mm -hmm. so it was with intention that i thought about like centering an older chinese woman worker in a futuristic setting because we mm -hmm. don't really see that i think of i think of james hong who i adore so much and of course he plays you know like a worker character in blade mm -hmm. runner he's the guy who makes eyes i make eyes right, right? he's the before yeah. he's gonna be brutalized he's such a good actor and he mm -hmm. finally says like he finally is getting his due in everything everywhere all at once right and he said that and he's you know he's been in 90 films or in tv shows and he's mm -hmm. always the bit player he's right. always the side flavor he adds you know the color he always sells it because he's such a great actor and i was thinking about that in this story like i have an older chinese woman who's a nanny and like why wouldn't she be in the future right why mm -hmm. wouldn't she be working and seeing it through her lens was very important to me and also i have to say this again responding to the pandemic and then you, you picked up on that like what inspired part of the story was nanny ads on next door mm -hmm. and you know next door is its own dumpster fire just in general but you know when the pandemic began in san francisco we kind of went on a semi-lockdown and like there was a curfew at night and like malls shut down and like there was all these um restrictions on like how many people could gather blah 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 but oh on next door man the nanny ads began <laughs> and it's like oh you know people and they they refer to their nanny as nanny like nanny has to leave to be with her family and so we need a new nanny and then like oh nanny blah 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 she needs a new job because we're going to be going to our second home and we, we can't mm -hmm. bring her and it's like oh aren't you sweet thinking about nanny's needs and then like the things that they would say they want nanny to do like you know it's like oh does not need to do housework we don't need a maid but and then they list things that are te te like clearly housework right mm -hmm. and like also i was shocked by the amount of like like separate meals for each set of children like each child needs a separate meal and snack I'm like my god these children have mm -hmm. like, such allergies it's amazing um so i wanted to write a nanny story and I was going to set it in the present. That was going to be my present day pandemic story. And it was just, but it was so revolting mm -hmm. <laughs> that I couldn't bring myself to write it. Cause I'm just like, what do I, how do I write about this horrible dynamic that I'm seeing? Um, and then there were the start of these brutal physical attacks on older Asian women, right? right. And there was like, there was a, um, a woman uh, in her, 60s or 70s in San Francisco on Market Street, who was attacked by a young man. She's just standing waiting for the bus, and he hit her. And so she actually picked up a board and hit him back. I thought, and, and um, I, I loved her fighting spirit. But when the paramedics came, like someone called an ambulance, they took the man and mm -hmm. left her on the side of the of the street because they couldn't understand her. She spoke Toisan, you know, Toisanese. And I was just thinking, like, what? the levels of indignities. And so I wanted this nanny to be my vengeance story <laughs> mm -hmm. on kind of the way, the invisibility of like older Asian working women. And so, um, and then I'd also just in general, I'd, I had wanted forever to write a Chinese space colony story. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, if you've been 
following the news, China mm -hmm. definitely wants a space colony someday. Right. And I saw on Twitter the um, U2 um, uh, Jade Rabbit little rover that the Chinese sent up to the dark side of the moon. Mm -hmm. And on Twitter, it was sending back these live feeds. It was so interesting to me. And so I thought, th okay, because I couldn't write it in the present because it was just making me sick. Suddenly I realized I could take my two passion projects and put it together. My revenge story on behalf of older Asian working women and my Chinese space colony story. And that is how the nanny came together. And so I'm glad the themes, like those themes came through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it just seemed like such a wonderful bookend you kind of have sort of like this rural kind of big city versus rural life opening the story and kind of really kind of giving us those, you know, I need to have this, I need to work this, you know, really kind of horrible, you know, job because I need to. And, and that kind of runs throughout a lot of these stories. I need to tutor, you know, this, this other kid, you know, and, and he needs to get good grades because my parents, parents weren't able to provide for me enough to live in America. Um, I need to take this nannying job. So, you know, I love how that this nanny story kind of bookends this in a, in a, in a very, very different way. Um, this, this sense of need that it still exists in the future. And it's, in some ways that's tragic because it, it, it's, it's, you know, in some ways selling, telling us that, you know, as, as much as we've progressed as a society, we've, we've, these things have um, persisted. A lot of these inequities have persisted. And I say progress in quotation marks because again, there are these anti-Asian attacks and there are several lines in these stories. There's one in particular, I'm gonna to try to paraphrase, um, where characters said that they felt ordinary until they went to the Midwest, mm -hmm. which suggested that, you know, on the coasts, there was at least some level of feeling that they were a part of this larger community. And of course, on the West Coast, there's a larger Asian community. And for me, I didn't really think about race um, in, I think, ways I probably should have until I moved to the Midwest, right? And over the past few years, um, year one, year two of the pandemic, you're seeing these vicious attacks on Asian bodies in places that I would have normally said were 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 safer for for Asian people and and yes. so yeah so so there is where are the safe spaces and you know for me that was kind of one of the things you know when when how high came out is that I wanted to just depict Asian people living their life I didn't want to call attention to the Asian attacks but I just wanted, I felt it was important for people to just simply see people surviving and hoping for something. Uh, and I love that. I yeah. love that. I love it. I noticed mm -hmm. it and I loved it. It's mm -hmm. so, it's sadly so rare, right? Mm -hmm. it's sadly so rare. And like, and again, like you have two different Chinese characters in one scene and neither of them are representing Chineseness. Mm -hmm. And they talk to each other. And I was like, well, have I seen this in, a, in another novel like this? It was amazing. It was, and I just, um, in, in, a, in a future setting, you know, horrible, horrible, talk about bad mm -hmm. job. Right, right. right. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, I feel like this is my affinity also. Like, maybe that's why yeah. I felt like, oh, I love this novel. Because like your characters <laughs> have some really- Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I think we have time for maybe one other question. And, and I'm really curious about this because I'm also of, of mixed heritage. Um, but, you know, in Japan, I lived in Japan for a couple of years and, and some of your characters also experienced this, but I was kind of like a stealth foreigner, you know, and I, I had to make myself known to other um, Americans, to, to, to expats who were, who were living, um, you know, in Japan, if I wanted that kind of community. But at the same time, Japanese police saw my mannerisms. They saw how I dressed. I was not nearly as fashionable <laughs> as, as, as some other um, uh, Asian men. And, and they would pull me into the police box and say, well, where's your foreigner card? Mm -hmm. um, and on the, on the flip side, in America, you have these interracial characters who are deeply aware of their identity, in part because oftentimes their, their parents, their, their mother, seem to be, their white mothers seem to be still wrestling with this issue of race. Um, but they were never really able to articulate that to maybe themselves and certainly not to the rest of their family, creating this tension 
for, for everybody. Can you talk a little bit, because it happens in several stories, there's Lulu who appears, I believe, in, in multiple stories. Yeah. Um, can you talk about this uh, theme of, I guess, interracial relationships and, and, and mixed race children and, and, and why that was important to have in, in, in this book? Thank you for those questions. Yeah, I mean, I've written a lot in memoir and essays about this because I, you know, like, do have a mixed race family. My father's Chinese, my mother's mm -hmm. white. And when we first moved from the New York City metropolitan area, where my father had been chair of Asian studies at City College, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and then we moved to the Midwest and South Dakota, and people literally would stop their cars as they were driving mm -hmm. down the street to turn and stare at us. Right. And then people, like, over time, like, white people came and they would shoot at our house and like five of our dogs were killed this way and it was just it was it got it just it kept, it kept escalating i kept thinking like well at some point they're going to get bored no <laughs> mm -hmm. not really my family i left it when i turned as soon as i turned 18 i got the, the hell out mm -hmm. um my parents and brother had to stay there longer because they couldn't sell the house a lot of issues um and so i i've struggled with how to represent that in mm -hmm. fiction and right. for many many years i didn't representative fiction because I thought it was too specific to me but then actually readers started reaching out to me maybe from like some of the memoir work I've done or essays and and they'd say oh and they'd start sharing their stories of what they themselves had experienced growing up in various parts of the country and I realized it's not just us right. this is something that happens and it's just for whatever reason it doesn't get talked about mm -hmm. and and then again like speaking about like responding like why did they end up in this collection um because i could have included other stories but you know different stories but why did i want them in this it was i feel like again response to the pandemic i remember hearing on npr once this conversation that white parents who had adopted transracially like the asian children were shocked by the rise of the anti-asian violence they didn't know that that happened mm -hmm. in america they didn't realize in their you know in their imagination that there was racism against asians because they didn't experience it they're not asian right. and they didn't know how to talk about it with their children and so they were they were reaching out to like adoption agencies and they were talking on NPR being interviewed about like they just didn't know how to talk about it. And I thought, wow, even in like, you know, this day and age, it's 2020 when I was hearing this. And I'm like, you're kidding me. People still can't talk about this. And like I remember when I was growing up, you know, my parents couldn't talk about it. My mother was very, very uncomfortable talking about this. And she had been raised and I felt like, well, she was part of the silent generation. You know, she she was a generation that went through you know, the Great Depression as a child and then World War II and all that. And so they were just told to shut up and put up. And then, you know, as they came of age, they were told the way to end racism is colorblindness. You just never talk about it. You don't mm -hmm. see it. And boy, she clung to that like a religion. She was not going to talk about <laughs> it. And she was going to claim she never saw it. But I remember as a child, it made me very uncomfortable, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm experiencing it, the whole family right. is experiencing it, and we need to have this conversation. So then I thought it's worthwhile to include stories, because I can't, I mean, I know that I'm not the only person, mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah, people no, have told me. So I felt like, so then, then I will include it, um, because why are we not recognizing it as an issue? In society and it's certainly mm -hmm. been a pandemic issue so exactly right and it's it's also just part of the larger diaspora you know and it, and it should be talked and it's it's not written about nearly as much as, as it should and i haven't you know certainly written about it as as much as i should have you know um including i think my experiences you know living in hawaii where where it's very different because you know, thinking back to World War II, you know my my grandmother wasn't sent to an in, sent to an internment camp because the, the Japanese population was just so large there. Yes, they couldn't. They, um, couldn't, you know, they couldn't. They couldn't. Right, exactly. They couldn't. Didn't have the money to gather right. them all up. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I want to talk, you know, a little bit more about, you know, so this that theme, several of these themes, you know, really cut deep across several, so many of these stories. Um, but Jia and Slow Train to Beijing, um, Lulu is in both of those, I believe, right? And yes. um did you plan for um for characters um to kind of cross these stories or um did one of those stories come first and you just kind of fell in love or engage with that character more and decided to kind of write 
I guess, a continuation. Um, because by the time I got to slow train to Beijing, I was very invested <laughs> in this character. Um, and, and the same for Nanny, because like that was like a, a little bit of a longer story. And I hate this question when I get it, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, do you have plans? I guess one, you know, did you kind of plan that connection? And I guess the second part of the question is, do you have plans to revisit any of these characters or story arcs in, in, in other ways, i.e. Oh. a novel or or something, you know? Interesting. Um, in terms of Lulu, the character from Jia, mm -hmm. which is the Mandarin word for family, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to write more about her. So it was of intentionality that I would show mm -hmm. like her later, like showing her survival, because mm -hmm. they ended on a very fraught, Right. Um, like you just don't know like what's mm -hmm. what is going to happen to this family sure. and to leave it that way i felt like it doesn't go forward like it's mm -hmm. a collection right and so then right. i wanted another story about her so you can see oh it jumps forward in time now mm -hmm. she's in her 20s she's not a child and she's no longer living in the united states she's gone to live in china and um working and i thought that that was a way to show her in a different space still you know, still mm -hmm. trying to find that, like the, all the characters are always looking for that safe home. Right. We don't quite find it, right? It's always going to be tomorrow in Shanghai. It's always going to be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's a hopeful thing, but it's also kind of sad in the moment. Right. Um, but that's, that was intentional in terms of, um, like, do I, had, I hadn't thought about revisiting. Who would you like to see in the, like in a novel? Is there any character in particular? I mean, where? certainly, certainly I felt the nanny, like I would watch yeah. a Netflix miniseries on that. If anybody's watching right now, um, um, but certainly I think Lulu as character, well, I think was because you you give us like yeah. her childhood, you give us her as as a young adult. There's there's definitely an arc there, and and it really helped I think for me provide um, this lovely forward emotion where there was more hope. I think for that character, um, Lulu had you know such wonderful agency in Slow Train to Beijing that I love to see where she 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 saw the possibility for love for a relationship and and went after it you know and and coming from 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 the previous story where there was a little bit more uncertainty that we saw in some of these other stories and i think the story before that white rabbits you i think you did something similar there as well where um you gave us a little bit more of hope um we we saw um there's kind of weirdness with with the roommate, um, but we saw this nostalgia, this kind of return to home via the white rabbit candy. And if this had this been an in person event, you know, I feel like we would have to be we would <laughs> snacking. Have to share we would have to be sharing rabbit. a bag. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you point, pointed that out. I mean, it's like like the weirdness with the roommate who um, this character like. She, the white rabbit candy mm -hmm. reminds her of her mm -hmm. grandfather and she mm -hmm. goes to China, whose hometown, hoping to reconnect, mm -hmm. but he is but he has died. And like the Chinese room is like, why are you eating that old person's candy? Like, like you know, they have moved on in China to like right. richer and fancier snacks. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's like you can't ever go quite home. Mm -hmm. Like you can't, it's like things change, you can't mm -hmm. step in the same river twice. Also, like what you said, you were going living in Japan yourself, like there's like, wow, I'm in Japan, but then there's also like you're being othered. <laughs> right. Japan. So it's like it's that's kind of what it is to live in diaspora mm -hmm. there isn't quite that wholeness mm -hmm. of going to you know one in one place or the other there's only that hope for finding right and that roommate wanted a white roommate it was like oh you're yes. you're not the american i asked for and yeah. you know I, you know when i was teaching english in japan like my boss you know like i think said something like you know like you know I, I like to give you, I, I wanted to kind of give, you know, people like you a chance, um, you know, diverse Americans chance, yeah. because there are a lot of Japanese English companies that are looking for a certain type, mm -hmm. you know, um, that, that looks American, right. Um, when they're, when they're teaching English and, and, you know, students aren't going to say that, but that, but a lot of them are going to, are hoping probably for FaceTime with what they stereotypically believe to be an American. Um, and that was definitely showing through in that white rabbit story for sure towards the end. And I feel like this is like, again, where the marginalization of writers of color in general and of Asian Americans in particular in the United States and the publishing industry really bites us twice. Mm -hmm. There's one, it's just hard enough 
here, but then also if you go abroad, we're never seen as American, right? Because right. because America never shows us as American. You know, when's like you know, I I I just no names, but I recently read an a novel that came out this year set in New York City. There was not a single person of color in that whole novel. And I'm like, mm -hmm. come on. Mm -hmm. Like, how is that even humanly possible right. to live in such a bubble? You know, um, and yet there's still so many movies and TV shows and you know, the, the things that we send forth around the world as images of ourselves as America. And it's still very white. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that's inexcusable. It just is. Mm -hmm. I have one final question before I maybe go to Q and A, um, and that's just you know, what were some of the books or films or, or TV shows, other media that you um, found yourself going to as sources of inspiration, whether that be thematically or subject matter or, or structure wise? Um, you know, what are some things that we should be looking out for um, that kind of helped enrich this book? Well, one book that I had really inspired me was Charles Yu's first novel, mm -hmm. How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe. Mm -hmm. Many people know, probably more people know his National Book Award winning novel, Interior Chinatown. Right. But how to, live, um, how to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe, I feel is like a cult favorite in Asian mm -hmm. Americans, yeah. amongst Asian Americans and in Asian American studies classes, right? Because that's where I first mm -hmm. heard of it. It's like you said, you, you know, you were just, you had to seek out and try to find the representation. Mm -hmm. It's like still, right? Like before he was famous, I think we were all sharing this book. I was like, oh my God, it's so good. And what I love about it, it's, it's an immigrant story, but it's definitely science fictional it's about a, um, a character named charles Yu, mm -hmm. like the author is very meta right who is a time machine repairman and his father has built a time machine and disappeared into the space-time continuum and so the charles Yu in the book has to build a time he, he becomes a repairman so he can try to fix his father's time machine and find him and reunite the family and so he's traveling throughout the universe trying to fix timelines and um it's a it's so clever mm -hmm. but also what i loved about it is that it wasn't like it didn't emphasize the science of that and it was like it, it uses literary theory really like the literary theory that mm -hmm. you study in an english lit class to guide the mechanics of the science fictional not science fiction but science fictional universe and suddenly i felt like it gave me and everyone else permission Mm -hmm. to explore kind of in speculative elements and the future and these science fictional tropes, I'm not having to get into the science of it, but into the kind of like the emotional and like social impacts, right, in a novel mm -hmm. that uses those tropes. Because we get it. We know. We get it. Right. Like we, don't, we know what time machines are. We don't have to explain time or a time machine. There's enough, you know, people reading today that that doesn't have to be explained. And so you can be used in other purposes. And that's how I dared to write The Nanny mm -hmm. and set it 100 years in the future in a Mars colony. And I don't have, everyone has seen the, that movie of Matt Damon, was it called The Martian? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, so, I mean, enough people have seen it that they can understand how someone might build a colony on Mars. And you don't really need to see someone yet again, figure out how to make dirt that will grow potatoes or something. <laughs> that's been done. So right. I, that's, I'm freed up. I don't have to describe it. I can then describe like the social mm -hmm. interactions in this space. Awesome. Yeah, Charles Yu is wonderful at tackling social issues without being too sciencey about it. And also, you know, um, there's a short story of his called Fable. There's one that names escaping me, where he is sort of deconstructing sort of the video game tropes. Um, and so he's 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 so wonderful at you know like using these tropes, but also um Conducting literary analysis, really, yes. about about how we tell stories and how how and, and how those story structures can be, I think, opened up to provide a space for minorities, for women, what have you. Um, but I think we're about at the um, quarter two mark, so I think we'll um, maybe open it up. I think Elena might come back, and okay. um, we'll do a bit of a bit of a Q and A. Sounds good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sequoia, for these, oh, these thank you. for this conversation, these great questions and these thoughts. And yes. Okay, that was fantastic. Thank you both so much. Um, it looks like we have one question um, from Anonymous. Do you plan to work on any similar projects for the future? Or are you working on any now? 
um, like in terms of a short story collection or like I am, I mean, I've been working on lots of different things and so I won't talk about them because they're still in the process. Um, and right now I am like, it takes so much energy <laughs> to launch a book. I'm like, I feel like, oh my God, I will never type again. <laughs> um, I'm just, I'm at that phase. Um, but no, I, I will, I'm writing on things. I just, I don't feel like secure. But, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask this question because I know my students wanted me to ask this. So Koya, what are you working on? I am working on uh, two novels. Uh, one is um, with the same 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 publishers, uh, William Morrow, HarperCollins, and, and Bloomsbury. Um, it's called Girl Zero, and um, it is about um, a couple who's they lose their daughter uh, tragically and um, replace her with a shapeshifter, um, a Japanese cryptid. And it sort of becomes uh, a, a novel, a story of identity formation, where they're sort of training this daughter, this replacement daughter, to be the one that they've lost. But of course, this replacement daughter isn't their real daughter and is developing her own identity, her own interests, what have you. Um, and they're also copies, uh, other copies of this daughter that um, her father mistakenly created. And so there's other versions of her out there and they eventually kind of find each other and 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 um, journey to the place where, where they were born, this, this cave. Um, so I'm working on that. I'm also working on a novel with my wife, um, that, which is still in the pretty early stage, stages, but um, it has to do kind of roughly speaking with these kind of tarot cards that are kind of also portals to other realms. Ah, it sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. In terms of the girl zero, which I think it just sounds brilliant. Also, like every second generation mm -hmm. Asian American's mm -hmm. worst nightmare, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. you know you grow mm -hmm. up with an if you have grow up with an immigrant parent or parents or grandparents, mm -hmm. like there's always that sense of you're being compared to mm -hmm. every one of their friends' children, right? And mm -hmm. found lacking, and so yeah. there's that pressure <laughs> to shape us into the better version that they know that we're capable of being. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like, man, you have you have yeah. seized that. You have mm -hmm. seized that and um, found a really clever way to explore that. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. That sounds very exciting. I am definitely looking forward to that. Um, there's another question here from Anonymous. What is your writing process like? Do you write every day at the same time, et cetera? And that go to both of you. Do you want to talk about your process? So um, yeah, I mean, I think it shifts. I mean, like we were both professors. So I think, you know, during the school year, I'm on sabbatical right now, which oh, I need to nice. kind of, I need to kind of create a, my own, a different process or I'll just be <laughs> taking lots of naps. But um, uh, during the school year, you know, I, I try to wake up a little earlier, you know, there's that hashtag 5am writers club on Twitter. Sometimes I'm able to do that sometimes not, but I definitely do need to make writing a priority or sometimes at the end of the day i'm just i'm just too tired um or writing has to happen when i'm not teaching on my non-teaching days um i typically write in my office at home i write to white noise i need some kind of ambient um noise around me in order to kind of get in the zone as well and um I think I've said this in other interviews, but um, I'm a huge Star Trek nerd. So I listened to the Starship Enterprise engine rumble. Um, you can find it on YouTube. It's a 24 hour loop. And that's what I write to. Um, I also have like a lot of weird little superstitions. I have like a bunch of like rocks, um, carnelian stone, citrine that are supposed to like, I guess, vibe creativity. So I, I, I touch all the rocks <laughs> before a writing session. So I have a lot of weird little habits like that. The Star Trek engine loop white noise anecdote is like the best writing <laughs> practice I have ever heard. Yeah, that is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my writing practice has changed over the years. Like when I was younger and more energetic, I would, I always wrote like after midnight, mm -hmm. right? It was just because that's the only time in the day when I finally was free of like all the other things that can happen. And then now I am just too damn tired. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm not gonna even, I mean, my brain doesn't make it to midnight if the rest of me is still up, but my brain is not. Mm -hmm. So, and then the other thing is like, um, is ergonomics is like, I really have learned because I'm having some issues with like pain. That's the most essential thing for a writing practice now. Like I have to have an ergonomic desk set up, um, 
this sounds so banal and boring, but like if you're right, if you're writing out there, make sure your head is straight. Don't put that neck down. Don't put your neck down. And make sure your wrists are not torqued like that. You know, make them level with your keyboard. <laughs> um, it sounds stupid, but no, I mean, you will regret it. Like I regretted it because I didn't do it. And then it takes so long to get out of the pain cycle. Mm -hmm. So now like I'm not, I don't, it's not so much a, a time of day anymore like right now we're launching a book and i'm the acting chair of my department and i'm teaching it's like like i i'm lucky if i can compose an email that isn't grammatically incorrect and insane at this point <laughs> but like before this hor this moment um i have actually reached a point like i can if i like days that i'm not teaching right because teaching days too much it takes too much of the brain um i can it doesn't matter the time of day anymore i just need um a free moment mm -hmm. and an ergonomic dust setup yeah so I'm i think out that, of yeah <laughs> definitely yeah I'm, I'm definitely kind of i need i need like i have like various pillows that i'm starting to use because back pain is real um i think the question also noted kind of like do you write every day and I'm like I, I know a lot of students ask me that i'm like writing can take many forms and sometimes like you don't have you know the headspace for for actively writing but i all i will often sketch things out you know, plan things for when I am, you know, mentally present. Um, but reading as a writer, reading deeply, like things that are informing your work, I think I count that on days that I can't yes. write. Um, I, I watch a lot of TV and sometimes I'm, I'm I'm really stretching, you know, the research, but but sometimes, you know, film TV definitely informs the work. And 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 I will certainly watch certain types of of television when I'm working on a particular project. I think that's really good about saying reading also counts for writing. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's really important to read good books that feed the soul and feed your writing and that aesthetic you, aesthetically you like. There's, there's a lot of books. I used to feel guilty that I didn't get to them or they're very buzzy mm -hmm. and I should read them. But you know what, I've got to a point, like I can't read Poison, right? Cause then you, you, like, you know, if you're wrestling with the, in your, uh, wrestling with the manuscript and you feel completely excluded or it's a very it's it's just not nurturing mm -hmm. and nourishing yeah. to me and my humanity in its fullness mm -hmm. you know what i mean then i don't want to read that poison because then it just it just sucks away the right energy. Mm -hmm. okay um we have another question here from anonymous how do you write anger and exhaustion without becoming cynical or without kind of giving up or thinking, eh, nothing matters or nothing I write makes a difference? Anger and exhaustion. I guess that's the, I, I can see the themes I'm getting across in these answers. <laughs> um, um, but maybe I'm hoping, well, I'm not hoping, but maybe that's like pertinent to other people though. Um, I feel like in terms of nothing matters and nothing will, I write will make a difference. Like, I don't even, I'm so selfish. I don't even worry about that. Like mm -hmm. writing is like writing is my, is one form of my resistance to this kind of like op uh, this oppressive attitudes that we can get all around us every day. Right. And so um, like, that's what gives me the hope to keep going is like to go into that mental space where I have a creative practice and I can imagine other worlds and other characters and other people um and i think that you know i know my students have worried about that i mean ever since ever since trump and they just feel like oh maybe i should just be why am i writing why am i in a creative writing program why am i writing this like does it make any difference is there something else it's like it it's what we need to nourish ourselves mm -hmm. and if we don't nourish ourselves there is no resistance we will just become zombies and there, we cannot muster the energy Sarah Kenzior, the author, she's an expert on um, authoritarianism in Eastern Europe. I don't know if you've read any of her books or I follow, she also writes very actively online. And when Trump was first elected, she wrote this really great piece about we are entering an authoritarian era. And she said, what we must do to resist this. And she said, like, sort of like writing lists. She said, write a list of your values, write a list of things you believe in because you're going to find that they will change. Real, write what you believe is true, write your history because you're going to be told by people that this did not occur. 
And she was saying it was very simple practices, but she felt as an authority, a PhD studying authoritarianism in Eastern Europe countries, that this was really essential to resistance to authoritarianism. And so this is, you know, I, I so if people don't want to believe me, I can point to this expert and say she believes, you know, that writing and writing even simple things and our values is essential to resisting. And she studied this and she knows. And so that's that is one of the things like when I feel that despair that kind of keeps me going is that somebody more informed than I has already said that this matters. And then I also think about historically, if they look at writing, like I, I, I teach excerpts from the pillow book of say Shinagon. I don't know if you've studied that um, Sequoia, she was a, a courtier of the 10th century in Japan. Hmm. Um, and women in that era learned to write in the court, but they weren't taught to write in the, um, Chinese syllabary, the Chinese characters, because that was reserved for men. So they wrote only in the syllabary that actually reflected how Japanese is spoken. And so as a result, their writing was really fluid and depicted daily life very well. And so a thousand years after she lived, you know, many of us are still reading and writing and teaching her work. And I feel like who would have, could she have, get, maybe she could have a thousand years ago, imagine that but if that can last and have meaning to me in the present and give me hope then i have to believe that there is something important in the act of writing creatively and then beyond that i also think when the authoritarians get into power they always go for the artists right they're, all, they're like well, what's cool about all these people banning the books all right they're going to the school board and saying you can't teach this so if i want to even if i don't think i'm making a difference they're telling me that i'm making a difference because mm -hmm. i see who they're targeting and so that gives me some energy. So this goes to um, what are you saying about ergonomic mm -hmm. uh, uh, situations for writing? Yvonne says, it's not stupid. My back and neck, thank you for having an ergonomic setup. Um, we have another question from Anonymous. Do you think of your writing as inherently political? If so, have you ever felt a desire to write things that are not political? I'm a Grinnell College yep. liberal arts graduate. <laughs> writing is inherently political. Not writing is also inherently political, right? Everything we do <laughs> is inherently political. So I don't, I, I can't even imagine what that would be. Yeah, same. I think I, I've been trained to, I think, think there's a certain way, like I, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm just interested in telling stories about the dialogue between identities and that's, that's going to be political. So, um, I'm I'm not interested necessarily in telling, you know, I, I want stories, you know, to be entertaining to some degree, you know, and I want and I want people to read them, but I'm also not writing to um everybody, you know, I, and, and that's not possible. You're not gonna be, you know, you're not gonna be writing to kind of please everybody. Um, I'm writing for things that I'm interested in and and writing for issues that I believe need to be um, you know, explored more and and giving a platform for characters and lives that need to be explored more and shared with with other people. And anything that has any kind of realistic depictions of characters, mm -hmm. whether it's set like in the future mm -hmm. and science fictional elements or not, is going to is going to be political because we live in these systems, right? And so, mm -hmm. how can a character live outside of that? I mean, even if I mm -hmm. wanted to write, like I'm not an, I'm not really good at nature writing, but if I wanted to write very specifically about, like, I don't know, the beauty of flowers given the nature of climate change, you mm -hmm. know, even that could be inherently political because I think there's a lot of effort that goes into sustaining nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, it's a rare story that's going to be entirely apolitical. I mean, recently there's been a lot of, of I can't really can't think of any. Yeah. And then there's recently, I think it's really more of a matter of like not reading well, <laughs> I think, you know, um, there's been, I think, um, with all these new Star Trek franchises, there's been a lot of protests of, from so-called fans that have been saying that new Star Trek series are too political. It's like, where have you been? <laughs> like, yeah. Star Trek has always been political um, because, I mean, that's, in some ways, that's the nature of the show. They're exploring identity, they're exploring race, they're exploring, you know, political systems. Um, so it I was think revolutionary. Yeah, exactly. It was revolutionary um, to have George Takei and Michelle mm -hmm. Nichols in there, mm -hmm. on, you know, on the bridge. Um, an interracial kiss that used to be a little exactly. so like now maybe it doesn't seem political because they their depictions mm -hmm. pushed and changed our present right 
Okay, and I'll just close out the Q&A with um, two comments, one from Carolyn. Thank you, Maylee and Sequoia for a beautiful and honest Q&A. Big congratulations to Maylee for another poignant, engaging book. Thank you for the work you do. Yes, <laughs> please, if you have not <laughs> purchased you, it yet, the link is in the chat. Um, and then another from Ariel, not a question, but thank you so much for hosting this great event. The Blair team is so grateful. Yes, and I am so grateful to my publisher, Blair. They are an awesome indie house. And um, please support them and the strands. If you're interested in um, my book or Sequoia's book, you can order it and get it. And uh, we, I, we have very specially made book plates just for the strand that are, that, um, with a signature and my Chinese name seal on them for tomorrow in Shanghai. So. Yes, um, thank you both so much for an amazing Q&A, amazing conversation. Um, if you haven't already purchased, the link is in the chat, as well as um, useful phrases for immigrants and both of Sequoia's books, How High We Go in the Dark and Where We Go When All We Were is Gone. Um, anything else you'd like to plug before we close out? Not on my end. But thank you so much for hosting and thank you, May Lee, for writing such a wonderful collection. Well, and thank you, thank you, thank you, thank mm. you to the Strand and independent bookstores, right? There's a form of resistance, mm -hmm. yeah. right? <laughs> yes. So thank you so much. And thank you, Sequoia, for taking the time. It's been it's been so wonderful. Um, it's been so wonderful talking with you. Oh, for sure. My pleasure. On that note, thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Mm. Bye. Bye. Bye.